January 30th, 2006. Aggie Grant, 06. I'll try to be as discreet as possible because I don't want to implicate someone and then get sued. My girlfriend works in the office of a large dealership where we live. She has only been there about a month and she was dealing with handing out payroll checks. She didn't recognize several of the names and asked her boss. Her boss told her that she would take care of them and that it was no big deal. She thought it was fishy and asked me. The checks were made out to local football players at the local university, and even though they had never actually been working there, they were receiving huge paychecks. On top of this, a player was buying a car recently, and when she said they had to finance the stuff, he only had to pay about one one hundredth of the sticker price. Is this legal? Post never mentioned any player or school in particular, just that they were blue chip kids and that their boss was acting as a friend of the school. The comments in the thread that followed were littered with people calling the poster a troll. The post went largely ignored, as it should have been. Posts like these were not uncommon during this era. The thread had around 19 posts, including the original one, all being pretty skeptical about the whole ordeal. And rightfully so. It was a random post at 1.30 in the morning with no real detail. The post never mentioned any player or school initially. After the original poster was berated a little bit, he eventually posted one name and one school. Around six months later, on August 2nd, 2006, Oklahoma starting quarterback Rhett Bomar was dismissed from the team for violating NCAA rules by working at a private business and taking payment over an extended period of time in excess of time actually worked. Bomar apparently filed for 40-hour work weeks at a Norman, Oklahoma auto dealership, making up to $18,000 when he only worked five hours a week. It was also discovered that Bomar, or any other OU athlete, hadn't worked at the dealership since March. Words like this were the wild west of college football fandom, and in their chaos, they birthed the true disciples of college football faith. I mean, picture it. No live stream announcements, no cryptic tweets, no hinting at decisions, no respect my decision screenshots from iPhones. Back then, a top recruit might get a blurb in the local paper, a few scouts hanging around the bleachers, and if they were really lucky, Maybe a coach should drive a few hundred miles just to see them play in person. Coaches had their own boards, and standout players were simply known as blue chip prospects. An important figure in the landscape of sports recruiting early on was James Heckman, particularly through his founding of Rivals.com and Scout.com. While attending the University of Washington in the 1980s, Heckman cut his teeth in digital publishing of a platform that eventually supported over 100 magazines. His real breakthrough in the sports world came in 1997 when he founded Rivals.com. Backed by high-profile investors like SoftBank, Intel, and News Corp, Rivals was a pioneer in providing in-depth coverage of high school athletes. Ekman and his team of Microsoft engineers developed the foundational technology for what we know as blogging, essentially creating one of the first large-scale social networks focused on sports. Ekman continued his innovation in 2001 with the founding of Scout.com. Built on a subscription model, for this venture, he relied on the same executives and engineers who had helped him build Rivals. Rivals was sold to Yahoo for $100 million. Scout.com was acquired by News Corp in 2005 for $60 million. The company eventually went bankrupt and was purchased by CBS in 2017. Both platforms revolutionized the way fans, coaches, and athletes interact and consume information, transforming recruiting from a behind-the-scenes process into a mainstream, year-round spectacle. Through Rivals and Scout, Heckman has made an indelible impact on the landscape of sports recruiting, turning it into a sophisticated, data-driven industry, complete with message boards, and each team getting their own tailored coverage. Shane and Terry is the entrepreneur behind both 247 Sports and On3. He founded 247 Sports in 2010, introducing innovations like the composite ranking system. 247 Sports offers two high school recruit rankings, its in-house evaluations, and the 247 Sports composite. The composite combines ratings from 247, Rivals.com, and ESPN to create industry consensus rankings. For the 247 in-house ratings, five-star ratings are given to the top 32 recruits in each recruiting cycle to mirror the first 32 round picks in the NFL draft. These 32 recruits from each recruiting cycle are the players who 247 sports analysts believe are the most likely to be first round NFL draft picks in the future. We only have five, uh, sorry, 32 five stars to uh, model after the 32 first round picks. 
And once you get a five star, you keep a five star. In 2021, On3 was launched with a focus on modern data-driven approaches to sports recruiting. Want to know the odds of your favorite running back transferring to a rival school? Or the chances a player will commit to your favorite school? On3's got an algorithm for that. They're like the Nate Silver of turning 18-year-olds into commodities. In the modern world, it's not just recruiting websites. If you're a college football fan, you're likely well-versed in the spectacle that is college football recruiting. We see it all. The early days of youth football, the seven-on-seven -seven tournaments, the college visits, the no-shows, even the lies. I've got five running backs with potential first-round grades. I'm not trying to tell you five are gonna go, but I've got five with potential first-round grades. Analysts and reporters have become key players in this arena, some even landing high-profile roles with major organizations. Consider Mike Mayock, who began as an NFL analyst on NFL Network and gained a reputation for his accurate player evaluations. Today, he's the general manager for the Las Vegas Raiders. Then there's Andrew Ivins, the current director of scouting at 247 Sports, and his predecessor, Barton Simmons. Simmons, a former 247 analyst and former director of scouting at 247 Sports, is now the general manager for the Vanderbilt Commodores football team. In recent news, we've seen the impact of this relationship in real time. The transfer portal has become a revolving door of talent, with players seeking the best opportunities for their careers. Analysts are not just reporting on these moves, they're often predicting them, providing fans with insights that were once exclusive to insiders. These platforms aren't just passive observers anymore. Along with social media sites like Twitter and Instagram, they're the ringleaders, the instigators, the influencers, and whatever buzzword you want to throw in. They're as much a part of the game as helmet and pigskin, and just like that coach who thinks fourth and long is a perfect time for a fake punt, or a coach that refuses to kneel to seal the game, they're not going anywhere. Thanks to them, today, the game is always on, even when it's off the field. My skills is like down and stop, speed, power, read, block. It's like I do everything aggressive and try to be the best man I have to be. A player who had fans dreaming of what could have been, some even called him the next Lawrence Taylor, was Willie Williams. Hey, son, you hope I never get back in there, I will kick your In the early 2000s, to be noticed, to be rated, you had to be a big deal. And Willie, he was on track to be the biggest deal to ever come out of Miami-Dade County. Some were certain he would be. See, Willie was a composite five-star before they started keeping track of them. If there was such a thing as a six-star, he would have earned it. Born on December 14, 1984, Willie Arthur Williams III was the second child of Donna and Willie Williams. His mother was a corrections officer, his father a security guard and assistant football coach at Carroll City High, Willie's alma mater. Interestingly, Willie Sr. never played football, but his love for the game was undeniable. The young Willie grew up in a medium income Miami neighborhood with hardworking parents and a supportive extended family. His older sister was a bright light and earned her lottery from Florida State. Willie was just a kid when his parents divorced. A regular fixture at his father's football practices, a small boy in an oversized helmet, a sight made all the more memorable by his father's hefty frame. In 1992, Willie Sr. left the family abruptly and moved to Texas. He never returned. After his father's departure, Willie's life took a turn. He bounced from one relative's home to another, skipped school, and got into some trouble. By the time he was 18 or enrolled in any college, he had been arrested 11 times, mostly for petty theft and burglary. A friend of Willie's was once quoted saying, he wasn't afraid to get caught. He didn't have any money. So when he saw something he really wanted, he would just be like, I'm gonna go get that. As a freshman in high school, Willie was involved in a car accident that caused him to miss the entire football season. He was struck by a vehicle while crossing the street, spent a month in the hospital, and missed 90 days of school. However, Florida High School Athletic Association rules do not allow for any sort of redshirting of players. At the end of the year, Willie transferred to a nearby Carroll City High, hoping that Jeff Paris, the school's athletic director, would find a way to make him eligible. In a city where football ranks as the most important high school endeavor, Willie was one of many standouts. His team even featured two future NFL players, including a future college teammate, safety Kenny Phillips, and defensive lineman Ricky Jean Francois. Willie's name was known, but his full story was not. 
Willie was so good in high school, sometimes he just did his own thing on the field, and he could do it all. He was an every down, punch you in the mouth linebacker who loved hitting you. He could run sideline to sideline with the fastest skill players in Florida and did it often. Picture a guy who's got the size of a Jeep and the speed of a gazelle that's late for a really important gazelle meeting. In the state championship game over Orlando Edgewater, he didn't just register a pair of sacks, he was the emergency room on turf, knocking their first two quarterbacks out of the game. The first kid dislocated his shoulder, the other broke his arm. Bill Gerke, an Orlando high school coaching legend, admitted that no matter how often he adjusted, he had absolutely no answer for Willie during that game. See, Willie was less of a high school linebacker and more of a one-man wrecking crew with a pension for dramatic exits, and other people's exits, to be exact. As a high schooler, he was a living, breathing, danger-keep-out sign, and he relished every minute of it. To Division I coaches, Willie was a gift from the gods. Ranked by most scouting services as America's top-rated high school senior linebacker. He was also a solid student, scoring 1070 on the SATs and maintaining a 3.0 GPA. In stature, he could pass for an NFL player, and not just a body on an NFL team, a 53-man roster guy. From what I can find online and from what I can remember, he was around 6'2", approaching 6'3", floating around 220 pounds as a high school senior. Willie had top Division I coaches salivating over his services. Nick Saban once said Willie had one of the best reputations as a football player that he'd ever seen. His coach at Pace High School, Joe Zaccheo, even went as far as to call Willie the best ever at his position. But still, to the country at large, he was virtually unknown. Then he was approached by Manny Navarro. You see, before Manny Navarro was the established journalist for The Athletic that he is today, he was a hungry, up-and-coming young journalist. Navarro proposed a diary project to Willie, an idea that immediately appealed to Williams. Willie loved the opportunity to be heard, Navarro was quoted saying. Oh, he loved it. He was a very descriptive person. He saw the world colorfully. It was a perfect match. Willie wrote some of the following in his diaries that were published. His weekend visit to Florida State felt like a scene from the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. From a ride on a private jet to feasting on hundreds of dollars worth of steak and lobster tails at Tallahassee's most elegant restaurant, the Silver Slipper. His experience at FSU was so impressive that it put the university back in contention with the University of Miami for his services. Willie was greeted at the Tallahassee airport by defensive line coach Odell Haggins, who had a box of chicken wings ready for him. Then he was taken to the Radisson, a place he described as the most beautiful hotel he'd ever stayed in. At dinner, Willie was joined by nearly a dozen other recruits, including Northwestern cornerback Trevor Ford and Killian cornerback J.R. Bryant. They were all encouraged to order as much food as they wanted. After dinner, Willie was introduced to his tour guide, defensive back Antonio Cromartie. However, Willie quickly requested a change. Cromartie was on crutches, and Willie didn't want to be the reason he was hobbling all over campus. He also wanted someone who played his position to show him around. Cromartie was replaced by linebacker Ernie Sims. My favorite thing about being a linebacker is just being able to le legally try to hurt somebody. The next day, they toured the campus and learned about FSU's tutoring program. He even visited the home of Florida State head coach Bobby Bowden and was charmed by Bobby Bowden's wife, who served him a bunch of pastries. They hit the clubs after dinner, bonding with fellow recruits Xavier Carter, Xavier Lee, Aaron Jones, and Kenny Ingram. Willie's recruitment journey didn't end at FSU. He also visited Auburn University. The trip to Auburn was a bit of a downgrade compared to FSU. He shared a flight with seven other players and lavish meals were replaced by finger foods and ribs. He was impressed by the university's academic support system and the opportunity to play right away. However, the trip wasn't without its hiccups, including a flooded hotel room and a less than ideal dining experience. Near the end of the trip, Williams met with head coach Tommy Tuberville for 20 minutes. He told me how he coached Ray Lewis at UM and he thought I had the same potential, Williams said. That got me really excited about playing for them. He did enjoy a two-night stay at the Auburn University Hotel, where he encountered what he called the biggest bed in the world in a bathroom with its own waterfall. Willie's visit to Auburn wasn't without controversy. He found himself at odds with the locals, notably after declining the Tigerette's offer of spinach dip, stating he wasn't going to eat no plant. 
He also referred to them as farmer girls who talked funny. This sparked outrage among the Auburn community. The remarks quickly spread, leading to a wave of anger among the Auburn faithful. As soon as the Florida State column appeared, Manny Navarro began to get emails from across the South inquiring about Willie. After the Auburn diary ran, angry emails started coming in from all over the country. Willie's weekend with the Miami Hurricanes was a paradise experience, starting with head coach Larry Coker personally picking him up in a white Cadillac Escalade. He was accompanied by fellow recruits Killian running back Bobby Washington and Killian cornerback J.R. Bryant. We would get to a red light and I would hold on because the bus driver would just take it, he said. Coach Coker looked at me and he was like, are you okay, Willie? I was thinking the bus driver was crazy. Coach Coker was like, Willie, we've got police escorts. I told him, thank God. I thought the police were trying to pull us over and give us a ticket. Their stay was at the luxurious Mayfair House Hotel in Coconut Grove, complete with the jacuzzi on the balcony. The dining experience was equally lavish, with Willie indulging in ribs, shrimp, and barbecue chicken at Monty's, and a seafood feast at the Rusty Pelican. He also had a chance to mingle with University of Miami players DJ Williams and Antrell Roll. Willie was impressed by the weight room and the strong business program at UM. He was also thrilled to run through the famed tunnel at the Orange Bowl. Bone Crusher's rap hit, Never Scared, blaring on the loudspeakers. Oddly though, Williams kind of was. Wearing his own number 17 jersey, a number he wore at Carroll City in honor of UM's DJ Williams. DJ Williams was one of the 11 Butkus finalists last year. He had his own number 17 waiting for him inside the Canes locker room. In the next locker was the jersey number 52 the number once worn by superstar linebacker Ray Lewis. Dinner was followed by a trip back to Antro Roll's apartment for a few hours of video games. Then it was off for the night on South Beach. His visit concluded with a meeting with linebackers coach Vernon Hargraves and a final meeting with Coach Coker. Coach Coker asked Willie, are you ready to win one of these? Coker handed Willie the crystal football awarded to the Hurricanes as a part of the 2002 Sears National Championship trophy. Williams said, sounds good to me. All you need to do, Willie, is let me know, Coker said. The jersey is the easy part. All we have to do is scrape off the DJ on the number 17 and put a W. Willie's diary was the talk on all college football message boards around the country. Traffic on the high school sports page of theherald.com increased sixfold, exceeding traffic even for the news of the hometown NFL team, the Miami Dolphins. On February 4th, Three days after the publication of the final diary entry, Willie held the signing day press conference inside Carroll City High Library. It was a lighthearted affair, with Willie striding to the podium and announcing, I feel great about today. First, he teased the crowd with the Deion Sanders FSU jersey, only to ditch it for Miami gear. I'm going to UM, he announced, the room erupting in cheers. He signed the letter of intent and immediately called linebacker coach Jordan Hargraves. Coach Coker gets on the call. Clueless that he's on speaker for all to hear. Everyone here is ecstatic, Coker said. You're committed to us. We're committed to you. Let's do a couple things. Let's win some championships and let's get your degree. You've got that three year plan. Within hours of the press conference, the Gainesville Police Department filed three criminal complaints against Willie for incidents that allegedly occurred during a five hour span during his visit at the University of Florida. According to reports, Willie allegedly punched the local man multiple times inside a nightclub for no apparent reason. He also hugged the female University of Florida student from behind without permission, then refused to immediately let go. He also allegedly discharged three fire extinguishers at a UF Hilton. Channing Crowder, a freshman All-American at the time, was tasked with being a good influence on Willie, but the night took a turn when the party started. Crowder recalls, we get to the party side and the beers get involved and then somebody brings a bottle of Hennessy or something and then he turns into a wild animal. Crowder's plan to drink Williams under the table backfired spectacularly. Crowder continued, We gave him two Crowder cocktails, a half of Heineken, a shot of Patron, a shot of Hennessy, and a shot of vodka. He cranks up more. We get to the club, he's walking around, talking to girls. Next thing I know, there's a big fight in the middle of the club and he's on top of it all. Willie makes it back to his hotel room. He's followed by police. They come to his door and ask if he was playing with a fire extinguisher. 
he was four doors down from his friend that he had just fire extinguished, and all the dust was in the hallway, so they followed his feet back to his hotel room. He had the fire extinguisher in his tub with the trail of dust back to his room. Willie's wild night ended with charges and a court appearance. But despite his misdemeanors, his high SAT scores and support from his teachers, including the principal, helped him avoid jail time. On July 5th, 2004, Willie was placed on three years probation, ordered to perform 250 hours of community service, and was banned from consuming drugs or alcohol. Three weeks later, Willie was officially accepted into the University of Miami, and Coker exhaled a deep breath of relief. The Miami football program had been the butt of repeated jokes. Another year, another felon allowed to join the program that seemed to place far greater emphasis on defense than decency. Now both teams rush over there. Oh, I hate to see this. Free for all. There's a saying when recruiting's going on. Is he a Miami guy? A Miami guy is a guy that plays the game with a chip on his shoulder. The Hurricanes' first practice of the season was held on August 10, 2004 in Coral Gables, and Willie was the talk of the afternoon. After so many highs and lows and ups and downs, lefts and rights, he was finally here, wearing an authentic number 17 jersey, sliding the familiar white U helmet over his head. In the flesh, he was everything that had been advertised. His raw ability was unbelievable, like nothing I'd ever seen before, said John Beeson, a fellow linebacker. The way he ran wasn't perfect, but he was the fastest. The way he lifted wasn't ideal, but he was lifting tons of weight. He was an absolute specimen, John said. His days at Miami are filled with stories. One of the rumors about Willie was that he once hit his teammate Lance Leggett so hard on a slant at Green Tree practice field that Lance's face mask shattered. I spoke to Lance about this. He did confirm that it was a pretty memorable hit but his face mask stayed intact. During an August 24th practice, Willie's right leg was caught in a pile of players. He fell to the ground, screaming and reaching for his knee. Though the initial suspicion was a sprain, the diagnosis was much worse. Willie would need surgery to repair his LCL. His season was over before it could even begin. Two months later, while driving to Atlanta to join the Hurricanes for Peach Bowl preparations, Willie lost control of his Chevrolet Tahoe. The car flipped seven times, then slid nearly 100 yards. He emerged unscathed. Everything I've gone through has definitely matured me, Willie said. The accident definitely made me look at life real different and appreciate things because any second, the best things in life, the things you love and care about the most, might be taken away from you. He bounced back in 2005 as a redshirt freshman. He led the team in special team tackles, played in 10 games as a backup weak side linebacker behind John Beeson totaling 17 tackles, two tackles for a loss, and one QB pressure. He flashed the most in his second game against Clemson. Despite playing just six plays, he made four tackles, one tackle for a loss, and even blocked a punt. Formation. They've been close all day. And boy, if any of three of those guys, it was Williams that got it, could have been any of them. But for two. In the following games, he continued to make his mark in very limited time. Against Colorado, he registered five tackles in just 15 plays. Miami had a good stable of linebackers this year, with John Beeson, Tavares Gooden, Leon Williams, Rocky McIntosh, and Romeo Davis, all of whom played in the NFL except for Davis. Beeson was the 25th overall pick in the 2007 NFL Draft. Rocky McIntosh was the 35th overall pick in the 2006 NFL Draft. Gooden was the 71st overall pick in the 2008 Draft. And Leon Williams was drafted 110th overall in the 2006 Draft by the Cleveland Browns. If you watched this Miami team at the time, you would know they were fun to watch and very fast. They were sideline to sideline, and the linebackers looked like they could run with any position group in the country. When Willie was in in limited time, the defense didn't skip a beat. They looked just as fast, and just as big. He fit right in. Oftentimes, if he didn't make the tackle, it looked like he was always one of the first guys around the ball. During that season, guys like Beeson, Kenny Phillips, Rocky McIntosh, and Merriweather were always first on the ball closing. When he was in, he was often closing right there with them. Willie had the fans excited and often pondering why he wasn't getting more snaps. I can tell you honestly, when I was a teen watching Miami that year, 
I wasn't watching with the most analytical eye, but watching that 2005 season today, it's a true mystery as to why the coaches could not find a way to keep him on the field in some capacity. Now I'm never the type to say I know better than a professional coach, but it's truly head scratching as to why he wasn't able to see the field more. There were some games where Miami had a significant lead and still, Willie was nowhere to be found. If he were to play today, I believe he would spend most of the time rushing the passer. And not because he lacked the ability to defend the pass. Willie was one of those guys in high school that was pretty much deemed unblockable by opposing coaches. When he went up against college offensive linemen, he looked strong and aggressive. His play within the box translated well, even as a redshirt freshman. On July 11, 2006, one month before Willie was due to arrive at school for his third year, WQAM radio reported that Willie told the Hurricanes of his intent to transfer. He was one of the three most talented players I'd ever seen, said Glenn Cook, a former Miami Hurricanes linebacker who spent time scouting in the NFL for the Green Bay Packers and today the Cleveland Browns. When you're that talented, you can take over high school games, which he did. But college is different, especially Division I. You have to play instinctively, and to be honest, Willie didn't have great instincts, Cook said. You can ask 10 different people and get 10 different answers as to why Willie didn't work out at UM. Regardless of the reason, Willie wanted out. Willie wanted to attend West Virginia. He was quickly turned down by head coach Rich Rodriguez. The Mountaineers coach said he had no interest. Willie also wanted to attend Tennessee. Head coach Philip Fulmer also said he had no interest. Fresno State, Troy, both colleges Willie considered attending. Both refused to engage. His baggage was too much. On August 14th, Willie was finally settled on a school, Pearl River Community College in Poplarville, Mississippi. Wildcats head coach Tim Hatton was thrilled to add a player with Willie's abilities. He seemed into the idea of being here for one year, then returning to Division I, Hatton said. He arrived on campus right before the season began, and he always showed up late. Then he couldn't get his information in on time for registration. We were closing in on the deadline, and he just refused to do it. I was sitting there, trying to get him into school, and he was making me late. It was the tail wagging the dog. Finally, I decided enough is enough, and we turned him down. My defensive coordinator wasn't happy, but you have to have some pride in yourself. One week later, Willie enrolled at West LA College, a community college that played in the Western State Conference. The head coach at the time was Greg Austin, who had coached personalities in the past like Steve Smith and Chad Oshosinko. I was kind of unfocused with the South Beach life and my family and friends all in Miami, so I kind of wanted to get away. Williams and his stepfather, Leonard Presley, moved into an apartment near West LA campus in August and Presley found work as a security guard. Willie had to sit out the Oilers' first five games while waiting for school officials to verify his Miami transcripts. A delay made all the more agonizing by the team's 0-5 and five start. He would make eye contact with me sometimes on the sideline and I would shake my head and he would just shake his head back at me, head coach Austin said. We were telling ourselves we knew Willie would have made that play. Willie had 13 tackles and two sacks, in addition to a blocked punt against Moore Park, but that wasn't enough to overcome six Oilers turnovers. In the team's first win, he had 10 tackles and forced the fumble. Willie was still hopeful to transfer back to Division I college football. He even visited a UCLA football game at the Rose Bowl. Tom Jurich, the Louisville athletic director, called head coach Austin. The two knew each other from their time together at Northern Arizona in the mid-1980s. I need to know if you think Willie Williams is worth us taking a chance on, Jurich asked. Austin had no doubt. He's a great player and an even better person, he said. I don't know what went wrong in the past, but he's a real deal. Powered by Austin's recommendation and Jurich's well-known craving for a top-shelf football program, Willie enrolled at Louisville for the fall 2007 semester. Willie quickly became one of the biggest Louisville stories of the summer of 2007. Fans came out to the open practices just to see him, and then talked endlessly about the way he hit the sled during drills. This would prove to be the high point of Willie's time as a Cardinal, as he played sparingly in three games before being arrested for the possession of cannabis and was subsequently kicked off the team. The news got even more embarrassing for Willie, as the arrest report detailed him attempting to eat the cannabis in order to avoid getting caught. Willie eventually pled guilty to the arrest, and coaches were quick to point out that the incident has been his only trouble in his five years in college. Kicked off the Louisville team last September after his arrest on drug charges, Willie arrived at Division II Glenville State in January for the second semester. Played spring ball, 
and paid his own way to take two summer classes toward a business degree. Willie's Glenville State Connection was Jerry Seymour, a teammate at Pace High School in Miami. Seymour was another Glenville reconstruction project. He was an all-mid-American conference running back at Central Michigan in 2004, then was suspended from the team and served jail time for his involvement in a fatal beating outside of a bar. Seymour was out of high school for two years and transferred to Glenville for the 2007 season, where he set a school record with 1,714 rushing yards. We just brought him in, had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion, and let him know what we expected so we're all on the same page, head coach Fiddler said. He's trying to turn things back around and get back to where he was coming out of high school, when he was one of the top prospects in the nation. He's made some bad decisions. Most of Willie's troubles were when he was a minor. Hopefully he's matured, the head coach said. He began 2008 on the campus of Glenville State College in rural West Virginia. He went through spring ball with us, and he's the best I've ever seen around, says Fiddler. One time, we ran a speed option at him, and he didn't just tackle the quarterback. He headbutted him and gave him a concussion. It was just a tap to Willie, but he was just so damn strong. Ultimately, his transfer to Glenville State was denied by the NCAA. A problem head coach Alan Fiddler said was a misinterpretation by the school's compliance department and not any fault of Willie's. It was Fiddler who worked the phones and found Willie a landing spot at Union College, where Willie arrived just eight days before the school's first game. He then went out and became the NAIA's Defensive Player of the Week after putting up 13 tackles, two sacks, and two fumble recoveries. He finished the season with 150 tackles, 19 and a half tackles for a loss, and 11 and a half sacks. Multiple league scouts traveled to the Union to see Williams practice, including the Green Bay Packers, San Francisco 49ers, Denver Broncos, and the New York Giants. Many other teams called or asked for film to be sent, including the Cleveland Browns, Jacksonville Jaguars, Philadelphia Eagles, and the Washington Redskins. The Packers, Browns, and 49ers also watched Willie at his pro day, which was held at Eastern Kentucky University. Willie put up solid numbers in that performance too. According to the numbers released by the school, he measured in at 6'3.5 and 230 pounds, showing the size to be a weak side NFL linebacker. He did 26 reps at 225 pounds, one more than Wake Forest's Aaron Curry. He ran his 40 yard dash in the mid 4 5 range and showcased NFL caliber agility. In a message to NFL teams, Willie expressed the following I want teams to know that I'm all in. I'm focused, and this is what I want to do with my life. You can trust me. Five or six years ago, I probably would have looked away a little bit when I answered that, but I'll look you in your eye now. I definitely learned from all my mistakes. A lot of my past mistakes were so immature, and I'm not blaming it on me being younger or because my dad died and all of that. It was my fault. I had to learn from that. Coaches were quick to come to his defense too. Reed said that at Union, they had a standard drug screening for its athletes and that Willie never failed a single test in the time that he was there. Fiddler said that when he was at Glenville State, he pushed Willie about his past. He said that Willie was remorseful and open, admitting that he had made mistakes and that he didn't want to push the blame anywhere else. Fiddler said Willie was never a behavioral problem either, a sentiment backed up by Larry Coker. Look anywhere along the journey and coaches will gush about Willie, regardless of whether he played for them. Fiddler said his Glenville State team couldn't block Willie in practices. Union coach Tommy Reed calls him the best player he's ever had in his program. Even Coker, who coached dozens of NFL players at Miami, admitted that Willie's talent was unique. Willie wasn't picked up by any NFL teams. He admits that he sometimes wonders what could have happened if he stayed at Miami, where he expected to bide his time behind eventual first-round pick John Beeson. Instead, he succumbed to friends and some family around him who expected that he would immediately become a college football star. I'm proud, the heights, I'm finna go out, we finna, like we was in the clubs, 16 years old, 15 years old, bottles, in sections, like it was, it was so crazy where I felt like I made it before I made it. At the time, I made the decision that I thought was best, Willie said. I felt like Miami wasn't getting 100%. I wasn't 100% focused like I thought I should be. Being born and raised in Miami, coming out of school there, I just wasn't focused. In 2010, Willie was found guilty of second degree burglary and being a persistent felony offender. Based upon his past misdeeds, as well as a burglary conviction in Georgia in 2010, the jury recommended a 15 year sentence. Luckily, Willie got out early and jumped back into his community with a helping hand and a new look on life. Fast forward to today and you'll find Willie in a different role. After spending some time in prison, 
He has found his purpose and focus in life as a coach, personal trainer, and mentor. He's using his experiences to guide young athletes and help them avoid the pitfalls that he encountered. He is also a celebrity trainer who has worked with rappers Jim Jones and Rick Ross. He even worked with recent Miami running backs Mark Walton and Trayon Gray. In his own words, Willie said, This is my calling because I felt so good giving back. I wanted to. I was searching. I was searching. And the knowledge I have, what I can instill in these kids, is crazy because I done went through everything you're going to go through. Even with the advent of the transfer portal and the glamour around current recruiting, Willie remains the most infamous recruit that never panned out for the University of Miami. To this day, Miami has not landed the top player in the state of Florida since he landed to Willie in 2004. Per 247 Sports, at the time of this video being made, he is still the number three highest overall recruit Miami has ever signed, only behind DJ Williams and Chantrell Henderson, both of who played in the NFL. He is still ranked in the top 50 of every football player scouted by 247 since its inception. Some think he's the best player from the state of Florida to never go pro. With all that said, and as great as his play on the field was, Willie's story is more than just a football story. It's a testament to the power of resilience and the ability to turn one's life around. It's a reminder that while we may face setbacks, it's never too late to find a new path and make a positive impact. Willie was arrested 11 times before he ever played a snap of college football. He failed several coaches, burned bridges, and failed to meet others and even his own expectations before he figured out his own path. He tried and failed several times until he was in his 30s. He battled adversity early and found a way to use his talents to get back to the community he proudly grew up in. The ending to his story is one even he couldn't predict, but one he finds fulfilling today. Willie's story is about more than just a high prize recruit that fizzled out. It's a tribute to human will. Say you my n be your killer, nobody gonna play with you when I'm with you. Go against in and like is glitter ski on. He had all the makings of being the best defensive player to ever come out of Miami Dade County. How you gonna cross the nigga out rocking which I got you lit in the city? I've been multitasking, rapping and being a daddy to my little children. I've been spinning Williams name alone would send fear through opposing teams well, the play that put Mike Dunn we out for the cars. remainder of his junior season, and Bobby that's Patterson comes in, he bats down that ball and chases him from behind, like a corrals the back, just comes flying across the top, knocking the football out, knocking the players down, number 17, Willie Williams, calling him the best linebacker in the land, and he's proving that for us tonight. Here in the state Pray championship game, it's snatch off from the Billy Williams to find Richard Freshman. Bet I'm on my when I'm outside, so they don't ran down. Call him pants down. And Williams just beats his guy right at the line of scrimmage because he's so athletic. Williams trying to live up to his big potential came in as a top recruit. No hands stepping, crush my arms totally. Wood just broke no motion, sleeping on sofas, creeping in highs like ropes. I don't want cages to stay. They've been close all day. Boy, if any of three of those guys, it was Williams that got it. Could have been any of them. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. I promise. Can't take me. Can't guard me. I've been just like Charmin, aka Twiggy Carvin. We could have been superstars. Remember when we were jacking cars? Now it's not safe for you. You switched like a little. Damn, my n you tripping. We could have been superstars. Can't help it now, I'm reminiscing. Remember when we were jacking cars? Now you better keep your distance, cause it's not safe for you. You switch like a. Track hard with the kick, snatch off on the. When I slide, night light on the blip. Willie Williams, the outside linebacker, just sitting back waiting on it. This is my calling because I felt so good giving back. I wanted to. I was searching. I was searching. And the knowledge I have, what I can instill in these kids, is crazy because. I done went through everything you're gonna go through.